Uh, welcome tonight to History Colorado. Um, this is such a very special night, thanks to these gentlemen over here, and a really special conversation. I'm really just so happy to be here with all of you. This has really been one of our first giant events um, since COVID has kicked off, and it just feels so good to be here in community with all of you. So thank you, like really from my heart for showing up and being a part of this uh, tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Dawn DePrince. I'm the Executive Director for History Colorado. And, oh, thank you. As we begin our evening, uh, History Colorado acknowledges that the land currently known as Colorado has been the traditional homelands of indigenous people since time immemorial. We are grateful to work in partnership with the 48 sovereign nations who continue to call this land home. Together, we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs to share the history of our state. And tonight, we are just so, we feel so lucky to host this very special conversation. And we were wondering, is this the first time the four of you have had a conversation like this? And I heard from somebody that maybe it's the second time, but we still feel very lucky. Um, you know, it just is a really unique conversation at a very unique moment. Um, we get to hear four decades of transformational Denver leadership. And I think, you know, for us at History Colorado, conversations like this are just really tangible illustrations of our mission, which is really, we learn so much from history that I think informs our present and really uh, helps to shape our future. We know that um, we are going to be able to, you know, reflect on these four decades of leadership at a really pivotal moment in, again, in our city where, uh, you know, Mayor Hancock is closing his final term. Um, and then of course, we just are collectively seeking answers to define what kind of city we want to live in as we emerge from these multiple crises of the last few years. Uh, so just reflecting on this history as we encounter this pivotal moment feels very special. Um, we uh, have both this incredible audience here tonight, but also an incredible audience at home uh, joining us. We're, we're so glad that you are all here. You're all part of a bold and growing History Colorado that is expanding its impact across the state thanks to exactly this kind of generous participation and support. Uh, we uh, encourage all of you as leaders from across the state to continue supporting our important work um, by becoming a member if you aren't already. Uh, you can visit historycolorado.org uh, anytime and become a member of this great 143 year old organization. Uh, two more notes I want to share. Uh, please mark your calendar for September 21st for our first installment of the Rosenberry Lecture Series where we will delightfully hear from Jorge Zamanillo, the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Latino. This new museum established by Congress in December of 2020 advances a representation, understanding and appreciation of Latino history and culture in the United States. And if you haven't yet, we also want to invite you to visit Building Denver, the exhibition. Um, this rich exhibit is on our fourth floor here at History Colorado Center. It explores key moments and decisions throughout Denver's history that have formed the city that we live in today. Uh, it is just open for a few more weeks. So if you haven't already, or you are eager to see it again, we encourage you to do that before it closes on September 5th. Speaking of Building Denver, we really want to thank the Building Denver sponsors. We've had some uh, just major support. Uh, Alec Garbini, uh, the Director's Innovation Fund, Bank of America, City of Denver, 
Community Planning and Development, the Gates Family Foundation, Anderson Mason Dale Architects, and the Urban Land Conservancy. And just one more note, a lot of incredible people uh, made this special night possible, but I really, and I don't know that I see him tonight, I really want to thank our former History Colorado board member, Alan Salazar. This was his brilliant idea and he helped us to make this happen. Um, he started helping us figure this out a year ago, yes. And now I am delighted to turn this over to the chair of the History Colorado Board of Directors, Tamara Ward, who's gonna introduce our guests. Thank you, Don, and good evening. It's so wonderful to see a full room and welcome on behalf of the Board of Directors of History Colorado to all of you who are with us tonight and also those of you who are joining us online. It is truly an honor, a real honor to be able to introduce this panel. Each of these leaders has made an indelible contribution to Colorado and to Denver. And each of these leaders and their families and their loved ones have given themselves time and again for the greater good and advancement of our city, our state, and our country. Before providing introductions for this both well-known and admired panel, would you allow me to ask all of us in attendance to take a moment and thank these leaders for their work, leadership, commitment, and grit. Thank you. Thank you all. To set the stage, I'd like to begin this evening reflecting on some words these remarkable individuals shared during their time as the leader of the city and county of Denver. Imagine a great city, Mayor Pena. The 19th century was a century of empires, the 20th, 20th that of nation states and the 21st century will be that of cities, Mayor Webb. We know and we've proved that good government is not about one person, one agency, one city, or even one good idea. It's the result of bringing communities together and finding solutions that benefit everyone, Mayor Hickenlooper. Moving forward together and getting through these times together does not mean that we'll always agree. Disagreement is natural and healthy. Dysfunction is not. And if there was ever a time when people needed functional, collaborative and efficient government, surely it's now, Mayor Hancock. And now to the introductions. And if gentlemen, if you'll join me on stage um, as I call your name. The honorable, the honorable Federico Pena has had, a success, has had a successful life in law, politics, and business. Born and raised in a South Texas border town, he's made Denver his home for nearly 50 years. Federico say, served as a mayor from 1983 to 1981, pardon me, 1991, and is credited with building Denver International Airport, bringing Major League Baseball to Denver, transforming Denver's Platte Valley, as well as 32 blocks into historic Lodo, the thriving urban mecca of housing and, and development we see today. Federico served in two cabinet positions under President Bill Clinton in transportation and energy, and later as the co-chair of the Obama for President campaign in 2008. Returning to Denver from Washington, D.C., he's worked in private equity and impact investing and has served on numerous corporate and nonprofit boards. With roots as a civil rights attorney, he continues to work for systemic change in education. Mayor Pena. The Honorable Wellington Webb spent 12 years as the leader of Colorado's Mile High City 
and played a pivotal role in leading it out of the economic doldrums of 1991 to, invest in, to an investment of seven billion in infrastructure when he left office in 2003. He is the only mayor in the United States history to serve as president of the US Conference of Mayors, the National Conference of Democratic Mayors, and the National Conference of Black Mayors. Mayor Webb was well known for his engagement with Denver residents during his campaigns. In fact, the tennis shoes he wore when he walked the city during his 1991 campaign are now housed in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, of, and Culture in Washington, DC. Mayor Webb. The Honorable John Hickenlooper took an unconventional path to public office. After starting out as a geologist, he took a chance at opening the first brew pub in Colorado, and in the process, he made a name for himself and for Lower Downtown. In 2003, John was elected mayor of Denver. In this role, he focused on bringing together people to address both city and regional needs. He unified all 34 mayors to fund and build Fast Tracks, the most ambitious US transit initiative in modern American history. He also made Denver the, the first large city to provide early childhood education to every four-year-old and opened one of the first offices of sustainability in the country. Yeah, he can move here. It's likely important to note as well that, that the mayor went to, on to serve as governor of Colorado from 2011 to 2019, and today serves as one of Colorado's two United States senators. The Honorable Michael B. Hancock is serving his third term as Denver's 45th mayor. He is a member of the US Conference of Mayors, serves as vice president of the National Conference of Democratic Mayors and as a member of the African American Mayors Association. A proven leader in the nonprofit sector prior to his career in politics, where he served Denver as a member of city council and two terms as council president, Mayor Hancock and his administration have led efforts to enable Denver's recovery from the Great Recession, innovating efficiencies in government, investing in infrastructure, raising the minimum wage for Denver's workforce, and prioritizing children, families, and small minority and women-owned businesses. Mayor Hancock and his administration have also led the city through the COVID-19 pandemic, protecting the health and welfare of residents, first responders, and businesses, and prioritizing public safety, housing, and economic recovery as we rebound from this challenging time. A grateful city, Mayor, thank you. Please join us. And now to our moderator, Laura Aldretti. Laura serves as the, as the executive director of the Office of Community Planning and Development in Denver. In this role, she's responsible for oversight of Denver's citywide and neighborhood planning efforts and the implementation of regulations for land use and design. Throughout her career, she has focused on planning and development in both the public and private sector. So Laura, you are the perfect complement for this evening's panel. And I want to thank you as well for your service to Denver and the important role you'll play this evening in guiding this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our guests. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And obviously the opportunity we have here uh, from History Colorado is amazing uh, to reflect. So uh, before, I'm just gonna take a moment of privilege because I actually have worked for three of you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, but uh, Mayor Pena, you have come to our home, my family's home, my parents' home when I was 12. Uh, and my, my <laughs> parents, my parents had a fundraiser for him as he was running for mayor. And it was the first time that I saw Latino looking to serve 
public, uh, the public service, move into public service. And I obviously it's had an impression upon me because I have sought that uh, back and forth through my career. And so thank you for, for leading uh, in that example. And, and all of you have, have led in that example uh, for so many of us uh, Denver kids. So thank you. We'll get into the rest of uh, uh, how, whether, how my performance was with the, with the other mayors <laughs> later uh, down the road. But um, I'm gonna ask, you know, we have questions here this evening. I would like it to be a dialogue. Uh, we don't have to go one by one down the, down the row. Uh, you don't have to answer. You can answer for everybody if you want to. Uh, but uh, it's really, there's a couple questions that are really specific to, to you and your administrations. But overall, it's, we want this to be a dialogue and a conversation and really help guide this city as we move forward, uh, you know, we're on the cusp in the next year of a new administration and a new uh, space for the city. And so I think the words uh, of wisdom that you will share tonight will be important for this city to move forward. No pressure. <laughs> so so I, I wanna start with a quote that I get to read every day when I walk into the web building, which is, what is the city but the people? And I think in recognizing that the, it is the people who truly make a city, uh, I, I would ask, you know, how do you view the mayor's role in building a city like Denver? Don't all jump at once. You want me to start? I, it, <laughs> Apparently, sure. I'm the oldest person since you were so young when I first met you at the fundraiser. I'm sorry, I probably should have said that. All right, that's all right. <laughs> Mayor Webb and I are joking about that. You know, Laura, before I answer your question, uh, I, I do want to say something to the team here at History Colorado. Can everybody hear me in the back, by the way? Uh, can, can you give them a round of applause? Let me tell you what. Yeah. Let me tell you what. It is not often in any city in America to have four mayors come together and share decades of experience and wisdom. So we're all blessed. And I'm honored to be here on this panel with these distinguished leaders. And History Colorado is, I think, growing in stature as it hosts these kinds of events and you're all here to support them. So give them all a round of applause, please. They deserve it. So Laura, let me, if I understand your question, uh, I think these days, if you're going to be any leader, whether you're a mayor or a governor, senator, uh, a president, the head of a large organization, it seems to me you first have to be a bold leader with a vision. That's not a throwaway line because someone who has a bold vision and as a leader will always have people who disagree. And not everybody will agree with your leadership style or your vision. So it takes courage and tenacity to do that these days. Secondly, I, I, I think to be a leader, you almost have to be a cheerleader, whether it's building an airport, or, I yeah, <laughs> or cleaning up, whatever it is, you have to cheer your organization, your city, your state, your country to achieve what might be considered the unachievable. And I think the third characteristic is at times you have to be a conciliator, particularly these days, Laura, where the nation is so divided. We need more conciliators. Mayor Hancock, you've talked about that, about bringing people together who disagree and sometimes fight among themselves. And then also, I think leaders have to be counselors when there is tragedy. We've all been faced with tragedy, a police officer being killed, a tornado hitting the city, whatever it is, some tragedy hits a family. You've got to have the empathy to relate to tragedy in your community. And the last thing I would say, and this may sound boring, you've got to be a manager. You know, Denver doesn't have a city manager. We are all part-time city managers. And when you're dealing with a $1.3 billion budget, Mr. Mayor, or whatever the budget will be in that, this year, you've got to manage resources in a way that taxpayers and others will feel confident. So those are the characteristics, Laura, that I think 
are needed today in any leadership position. I'll, I'll expand on some of that, but I also think there are two other aspects that I never dreamed 30 years ago I'd be saying this. We're not well served because we don't have a decent newspaper. We have to have, we were really better served when we had two competing newspapers fighting each other, putting our news in the public view to debate the issues as much as one may not like Gene Amel, but he had his point of view dealing with the airport. You know, I took him out to the airport to try to convince him and he says, well, hell, as much as it cost, it ought to be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, it, it helped to have two newspapers and we were able to, if you can't work with one, you work with the other. So I think having the two newspapers was helpful. So now that it doesn't become a, a feeding frenzy in terms of how much money can you raise, how much can you be on TV, how much can you be on radio. Uh, I think that's very important. Second aspect, I think Denver's been successful because we have a strong mayor form of government. Um, I don't particularly like or care for uh, those that I know think they're doing the right thing by chipping away at the power of the mayor. Doesn't make serving as mayor more helpful in terms of, administra in, in terms of administrating the government. Uh, what makes Denver successful is we have a strong mayor system. And all four of us that sit on the stage have come up through that system. Other cities around the country, you wonder why some of them aren't doing well. They either have, you know, I don't particularly support city managers, but if you have to choose, it's better to have a strong mayor form of government. Um, you elect them to run the city, you elect them to manage the city, you elect them to have the vision, you elect them to, if there is a, uh, you know, someone asked me once, how do you make decisions on people you're going to support for mayor? And I used to say, if a plane crashed into a major entity in Denver, like what happened in New York, does this person have the ability to show the compassion to move and pull the people around him like he's the moral leader, philosophical leader, manager, as Federico said, but also the one that people look to to make everyone feel like we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay because we got a mayor that's standing up for us. We need a mayor that's going to stand up for us over, all, over everything else. And mayors also have to have the ability to say no, uh, especially to friends uh, who sometimes can be your worst enemies. <laughs> Not on purpose, <laughs> but in terms of showing that objectivity. And so, you know, I'll just close and say, I think the characteristics of being a good mayor is being strong. Having uh, this last point, and I've shared this with other people around the country, you know what that mayor's value system is. And the people they hire should share that value system. You should not have people working for you that don't share your value system. Because now they're not working for you, they're working against you. And it's important that you have the ability that when, you're, when you say that ship's gonna turn left, it doesn't automatically turn left. It takes a while to turn that way. But your team has to be making sure that that ship is turning left. Uh, so your staff should share your values in implementing the values that you were elected for to be mayor. And I can I could just tag my hat on what they both said, uh, but I won't. Uh, let me add to it and just say that because the question started, I think, Laura, thank you for being here and just having served the city so long yourself. But what is a, a, is a great city, but it's people. And I think all of us shared that notion that we, part of our job was to attract talent. And whether that's getting large corporations to come with their senior executives who get involved in the community and serve on boards, or whether that's building our teams, uh, how, it's funny, I came in, I was the first white mayor in, in 20 years. And well, I thought it was very important to have, I thought it was very important to have a diverse 
cabinet and senior staff. And so we had, I think Federico, you started, you took over what was largely a white uh, run city. Uh, you moved it a, a long way and Wellington, you took it even further. By the time I finished my first year, we were 50% people of color, 60% women. Uh, and that making sure that as you diversified the staff, you never sacrificed excellence for diversity. So you were always hiring the best person for the job every time so that you're the city in, in terms of all of us, I think has and continues to have a real reputation for attracting talent. And part of that was attracting young people. I mean, the Red Rocks, you know, you have an asset like that. And now, now Red Rocks gone from 30 concerts a year to now it's, I think, close to 200. Someone here probably can tell us 195. How many? Over 200? Over 200. Over 200 now. That's, I mean, we have young people. We are a destination for young people. And, and we're getting the pick of the talent there that attracts employers. Again, you imagine a great city. It's a, a city filled with talented young people. First of all, I'm honored to be up here now. Y'all can see why I meet with each one of these individuals, these gentlemen, at least once a year to sit at their uh, feet and to, to absorb uh, what they're saying. And I was fortunate to work with each of them uh, before I even got into politics and to watch them steer this city. Um, and I got to tell you, I have a philosophy and, and, and it really is, um, the simple philosophy is this. Leadership does not require an invitation or a title. And if you think about our city and the genesis of Denver, this great city was founded by people that didn't have a title nor an invitation. When the Continental Railroad was bypassing Denver, it was the people of Denver who trenched and dug and said, like hell, we will connect to that Continental Railroad. And we did. When I became here in 2011, we faced a structural financial challenge. It wasn't gonna be fixed by raising more tax, well, it could have been, but why do that in the midst of a recession? Um, it wasn't, we could not cut any more. Mayor Higginlooper and Mayor Vidal did a phenomenal job in managing this city through a very difficult financial time. We were in the marrow of the bone. And so we had to make a tough call. And I'll never forget sitting around the table with my leadership team. And Carrie Kenny at the time was our chief financial officer. And she said, you have really two options. You can go from here to here to here to here to here to here to get to this answer. Or you can go straight here, one straight line to get to the answer. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And that straight line was to debruce the city. There were 12 of us sitting around the table, mayors. There were only two of us at the table who said, we gotta go ask the voters to de the city. We agreed to do it. 10 said, you cannot do that. You're a new mayor. You will be, you will be polarized by the public. But what we did was we designed a process to go to the public because growing up in a city, one thing I've come to do is to trust the voters to make the right decisions if you give them the right information. And we did that. We held town hall meetings and we explained to them the predicament we're in and the solution that we designed. And debrucing of this city passed by 71%. It began the process of them recovering financially. What is a city but its people? We designed our housing strategy by town hall meetings. And it was also why as mayor in terms one, two and part of three, we did community, uh, uh, cabinet and community days once a quarter in every part of the city. Take the whole cabinet out, sit with the people, whether they like you or not, whether they're happy with you or not, because the reality is we are public servants. We are but the people, are here for the people. And that's why the question you ask is so pretty important. I believe that's why that statement is chiseled in stone above the web building. Yep. Thank you. Stay on leadership uh, because I've got four of you uh, who do leadership very well and know it well. Uh, there are different forms of leadership though. And I, I have seen that in my lifetime as I've moved uh, through the city living here with, with each of you at its helm. And in Denver's history, each of you were faced with a remarkably different circumstance when you first took office. Given the setting in which you took office, 
what did you see as the elements that needed to be delivered most in that moment? Uh, I'll start this time. <laughs> 2011, in the throes of the deep recession, uh, Denver was brimming with possibilities, but there was, um, I'll explain it to you through a story with meeting at one of our incubators in Denver with small business leaders. And I think Federico said this when he started. Sometimes you take these jobs, you'll realize the chief job of mayor is to be the chief marketer or cheerleader of the city. You also learn very quickly what you say matters. And I sat with some entrepreneurs and in, uh, they, they said, man, what's your vision for small businesses in Denver? And I said, I want us to be the startup and small business capital of the nation. And those young people looked at me and said, Mayor, you already are. What we need is a cheerleader. Someone to tell the world who we are and Denver's where you want to be if you want to start a business. And, and I think what I found in 2011 was Denver was a city without hope because it wasn't because of the previous leadership, it was because the recession had beat us down. Foreclosures, you might recall, we led the nation at one point. We had neighborhoods that were number one in the nation for foreclosures. Ms. Fulber, you and I lived in one of them. There were blocks with abandoned properties or foreclosed properties in parts of our community. Our soul had been bruised. And what I found Denver needed more than anything was a mayor or leader who was optimistic, who had a vision and had the courage and the forthright to say, this is where we're going. And if we work together to get there, we're gonna be successful. That's what I found in 2011. Thank you. And I agree with everything Michael said. And, and you know, I think each of us played off each other. In other words, the city needs change and needs freshness. Uh, and I think when I came in, Wellington, for very good reasons, had uh, pretty much taken Mayor Tower down to his knees at one point. Uh, there was a, a serious feud, and yet, as a small business person, and I was kind of determined to bring the small business perspective into, into city government. And, and keep in mind, I'd never run for office, so I was clueless. And I will say Mayor Webb spent several hours with me the day after the election, walking me through his vision of what needed work and what didn't, and it was seamless. Uh, and every challenge I think I had, I would always call him. But one thing I felt deeply was we had to have unity. We had to unify the city. And the reason I was lucky, maybe you know Elba Wedgworth, she was the president of city council and she took me under her very capable wing and basically said, and she was very gracious. I know sometimes she can be a little more direct, but with me, she was, she was saying, maybe if you phrase that in a different way, you might, you might last a little longer, I think, because of what she was saying. But she helped solidify the, the city council in 2003 about that we should work with the suburbs and we should reach out and not only fast tracks, we're the only metropolitan area in the country where we don't poach cities from each other. The municipalities all have agreed that we're going to work together, that united we stand and we will attract businesses to come here and we attract entrepreneurs, small business startup center of the, of the country, but we won't bicker once, they, once we get them coming to the region. We'll let them decide where they want to come. And I think that's that approach of unity was different than what was needed before, because right when, when Mayor Webb was in there, we were in a in a fist fight for a lot of, I mean, we don't have to go through it, but it was a it was a difficult time. And those transitions, I think, help cities to find themselves and see that it's not one way or another, but at different times it's different approaches. I think sometimes you can't be predictable. Uh, and I certainly use that to an advantage, and I'll share two stories. Um, after Mayor Pena left, and I was trying to get United Airlines to come visit, and they said they would get to me in a week or two, and Stephen Wolf had called and said that uh, he wanted to meet me, and I said, well, that's great. You know, we did all the pleasantries, and then he said, I'll have my scheduler call your scheduler, and I said, by, by the way, where are you going to land your aircraft next week? Then there was this pause on the phone. And he said, what do you mean where are you going to land my aircraft? I said, the gates belong to the city. You don't have a lease with the airport. 
So I guess you're gonna land him in Colorado Springs and bust him to Denver. Um, he said, you can't do that. I said, man, I'm too new to not know what I can't do yet. <laughs> So as it turned out, we met at Strings two days later. <laughs> and uh, he brought his attorney and I brought Dan Muse and Bill Smith and then that's uh, the infamous baggage system and they flew back to Chicago. And as a uh, condition of United signing the lease, it also called for a baggage system that took bags to Casper and to Torrington. <laughs> which was actually a United system that had been practiced on in uh, Dallas by BAE on a round track. And as all of you know, BIA is, is, is longitudinal. That shows you big business doesn't always know what they're doing. So, so, the, so that's one example about being unpredictable. I also love to take foreign delegations to uh, uh, Holly knows I love take bringing the foreign delegations up to Red Rocks, um, especially before we're going to negotiate a deal, S especially if they're from low elevation. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? This is all true. <laughs> we would take them up to Red Rocks, 5,000 feet so they can see the city. Holly would have the room all set up and we'd bring the British and the Germans in and have a couple of drinks the next day they say, I don't remember doing any of that. You know, I said, well, you did last night. And, uh, the, the, the last one is that um, this job is, is tough because you deal with, I remember during my term, we lost 12 people, six police officers, three firefighters, and three sheriffs, not counting the kids that died during the summer of violence. And to see a 14 year old that looks angry, frightening, but to see him in a casket, he just looks like a little boy. And I remember we had one kid working for the city and he lived on 24th and Vine, matter of fact. His paycheck is what we had to use to bury him. And we finally were able, were able to sign a truce between Bloods and Crips on the corner of 34th and Steel. And Michael commented a couple of times of me and Wilma and Roderick Bell's mom and Dave Machad standing between Bloods and Crips saying, you're killing your own kids. Sometimes it takes courage. Sometimes it takes luck. I always believe it also takes faith. Um, and I think being unpredictable sometimes, I'll just close on this. And Liz knows this. I, I also believe in, as much as I fight for city employees, I believe it's important to hold them accountable. So Jim Martinez and I are walking down 16th Street, we pass and see a public works truck parked in the alley without a driver who left the keys in. So obviously when he came back, the truck was missing <laughs> because we moved the truck five blocks away and put a sign on the truck that says the keys are in the mayor's office. And like a lot of city employees, they said, I bet he didn't have a chauffeur's license. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> Those are great, great stories. I, I, I guess I could tell airline stories too, but I won't tonight. <laughs> but I think Laura, when you first came in, what, you, what were the what were the seven months for? Well, I'll try to be brief. Um, in 1982, there was a sense of discontent that was in the city. People like me, I was 36 years old, whatever it was. Uh, I was a member of two neighborhood organizations, and we in the neighborhoods felt that, quote, city government was not listening to us. And so there was this feeling that we could do much better if there was a city government that accepted the views of citizens. We talked earlier about people. And so I ran for office. Uh, as we know, everybody was a little surprised that we did so well. But the important point is that in that election, 
there was a 73% voter turnout in an odd year, odd numbered year. And typically when Mayor McNichols would run, there was about a 51 or 52% voter turnout. So there was this enormous involvement by people who had traditionally not voted in mayoral elections. And there was a great deal of excitement. And as a result of that, there were very high expectations, very high expectations. And people thought, wow, this guy is imagine a great city, he's gonna run, you know, he's gonna first day his office, he's gonna do everything in one day. And then a very interesting thing happened about four or five months into my administration, we were hit with a recession. <laughs> and so those high expectations that people had, I had to ameliorate a little bit and say, you know, we're gonna have to cut. Remember that? Yep. I took 10 days leave without pay. My cabinet took seven days leave without pay. I talked to all the city's employees and I said, you're gonna to have to take cuts and protect the fire department and the police department, run our city much more efficiently. But even though those expectations were a little dampened and talk about two newspapers, uh, I felt like I was a, a piñata <laughs> between the two newspapers who were all saying, oh, now what are you going to do? You said, imagine a great city, you've got a $20 million deficit, you've got a recession in your hand, ha, 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 how are you going to do all these things? Uh, I hate to get so emotional about that. <laughs> Let's not talk about that again. I can still see the headlines. <laughs> see the headlines. So the, the key was to communicate to people, we are still going to do what we said we we're going to do. It's going to be more difficult, but we're going to do it. And we weren't, we're going to work hard, and we're going to need all of your involvement. So all those people who got involved in that election, we welcomed. We literally opened the doors to City Hall. There were two bronze doors in, in City Hall that were locked. Some of you who are my age remember that. We literally opened them. And we said, we want people to be involved in your city government, because I knew what it was like not to be involved in city government. And that's how we were able to address all those issues, because we had thousands and thousands of people involved, and many of them were young. They were idealistic. They had no fear. And to all the young people who have recently moved to Denver, I want to say, you have the same obligation. You need to be involved now and help solve some of the problems that we're facing now. And remember, 40 years ago, it was a bunch of young people who made the city what it is today. Yeah. So managing those expectations was, was very hard. Talk about uh, being unpredictable. <laughs> so I campaigned on the position that we were going to build the airport by expanding Stapleton over I-70 onto the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. <laughs> Great idea, right? <laughs> I, I think I actually had a written position paper on that. And all the civic and business leaders, everybody thought we we're going to do that and talk about a right turn. That curveball that came to all of us was what happened to all of us when we took office. There was always a curveball, something completely unexpected that hit each of us when we were in administration. But back to the story, I'll be very brief. Uh, there was this position that I took when I was running for mayor that we we're going to build the airport on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And I was saying that there's a difference in being a candidate and then actually being in the position. And when you're in the position, you actually learn the real facts. And the facts were that we learned it was going to cost billions of dollars to clean up the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And there was this county to the north of us who made it very clear that we're going to sue us for about 10 or 20 years. <laughs> And that's when we concluded it wasn't a very good idea. And so we did a right turn, that's correct, right directionally, right turn, and decided to move the airport to Kansas. And uh, Kansas was thrilled because they needed a bigger airport. And so that's the decision that I made. The point I want to make, and I'll end with this, when you're in a position of leadership, and new information and new facts come to your attention, you have to have the courage to change your position. You cannot simply to continue to go down a path because you now have information that your original idea was incorrect. And talk about people being upset when we announced we were gonna move the airport and not build upon the arsenal. I will not go into that. But anyway, that was one of the, expectations that people had when I first ran for mayor and to build the airport on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal.
just talking to a gentleman here who used to live in Park Hill, and he said, thank you for eliminating the noise. <laughs> And the property values all went up, right? <laughs> and on Bella and Park Hill and Aurora, which was also citizens of Aurora were also suing us for the noise from all those to Anyway, I'll move on. Others. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to change the the conversation a little bit. And since we are in this fantastic history Colorado building museum that has building Denver exhibit, I want to talk a little bit about Denver's history. Uh, and I want to ask, do you have an episode from Denver's history that still inspires you today? Has it informed how you make your decision making on a day to day basis? I'll go first. <laughs> he, he said nervously. Um, <laughs> I love the story. And again, I didn't grow up around politics like these guys did. And they really understand, still to this day, obviously understand it much better than, than I do. But I was fascinated by an old story that some of you don't even probably don't know uh, about a guy named Quig Newton, who came and really cared and was involved in the city on circle on all these boards. And there were uh, there was a, an opening. There were the, the kind of ruling fathers. Uh, in those days, it was ruling fathers. We're trying to decide who could lead the city for the next step. And somebody said, "What about Quig?" And there was a whole. Various histories of Denver have chapters on Quig Noon, and he came in uh, without a lot of political background and tried to use basic information and data. And so much of what the city depends on now, he created uh, the civil service system to make sure that we treated our workers so well that there would not be uh, union issues, and that they would be, you know, be able to, to get paid fairly and have a fair workplace. Um, and I just love this. And when I first had this notion, I was going to run for mayor in 2003, at the end of 2002, um, Quig Newton was still alive, lived down in South Denver. And uh, I went down and spent a couple hours with him. Uh, and it really was a moment that I'll always remember because he was all about just getting the right people in the room and, and, and helping people solve their own problems. And he says, that's really what I did was trying to facilitate the ability of, of, of everyday people to solve their own problems. I, yeah. There's a, there's a book called The Old Way Mayors that I encourage you to read if you can get your hands on it. It's a very hard book to find, but it was handed to me uh, by Mary Alice. Um, um, Right as I was taking office, I read the book and it's a phenomenal history on the history of mayors in Denver. Just so you all know the history, I was Federico Pena's intern for three consecutive summers. I loved it so much. I see Bernita Durani out and she was one of my bosses. Um, I worked with Wellington Ware when I was CEO of the Urban League. He was the mayor at the time and we did a lot of urban work together. John was mayor and we came in together same day and I was president of city council. We worked together and we worked on the 2007 bond at the time it was the largest bond issuance in the city's history. Uh, we worked very closely together. So uh, in the convention, in the 2008 convention together. But here, here's the thing about Denver's history. So I, I say that because what has worked for Denver, and Mayor Webb talked about the strong mayor former government, that has worked, but also every mayor walking in recognizing the contributions of his predecessor and being able to accept that baton and say, I got to take it to the next level. That has made a difference. And if you study Denver's history, that is an indelible, unquestionable point that has made a difference in this city being as stable and as great as it is. The other thing that's made a difference is if you study our history at every critical and pivotal moment, transportation has led Denver forward. In the 1860s, when we decided we would build or connect to the Continental Railroad, no matter what the federal government said, key moment in our history. 1929, when Denver said it's time to go from rail to air, we built Stapleton International Airport. In 1995, when Wellington Rad, well, first federal Federico Pena, had the audacity to say, you haven't built the airport in how long? We want a new airport. He started the process of building the airport, got it ready, got it done, and runs and well built it. Key moment. This guy, 
jumped out of a freaking plane <laughs> to convince us to support fast tracks. No one knew anything about fast track, didn't care. All we wondered is, did he hit the ground? <laughs> fast tracks. And when I became mayor, you had fast tracks coming, you had an international airport, but we hadn't even scratched the surface of the potential. We had the largest physical airport in the United States of America, fifth busiest, which doesn't sound impressive until you think about we are a non-coastal city with really nothing international in our destination. We don't manufacture anything, but the fifth busiest airport in the world, 17th, excuse me, in the nation, 17th busiest in the world. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of our potential. And so when you ask me what in our history inspires me, it has been our genealogy built around recognizing the power of transportation, moving people, moving products, bringing people to Denver, and understanding that we are much greater than we imagined ourselves. And I'll finish on this story. I came and said, we must go global. It's time to take our rightful place in the global stage. Every one of these mayors worked on international flights. Every one of these mayors went to Japan and said, we're going to direct flight. Every one of us, while in Japan one day, talking to an airline executive, I said, it's time for Denver to realize its global potential and to take its rightful place on a global stage. You know what this executive said to me? He said, we all knew Denver was ready. We were just waiting for you to figure it out. That's your Denver, Colorado. We are the center of the universe. And if you don't believe me, get a globe, spin it, watch Denver be right in the middle of it. <laughs> I can move on. I can go to the next question on, no, on that. I'm still okay, okay. I'm Just restate the question. <laughs> history, a moment in Denver's history that has impacted you in the way you think about decision making. When I think back, um, two things come to mind. Three, matter of fact, we were so proud that Federico had won the election because he broke the ceiling that said that Denver would not be able to elect a mayor that happened to be a minority. And it's always hard being the first. Um, so, Rome and I, we have a habit of going up to Red Rocks and sitting on the top row and dreaming about what the future might hold. Mm -hmm. And Ship Ladies is a horse track. She grew up on 23rd Williams. I grew up on 32nd and Williams. So obviously we'd be betting two, three uh, <laughs> numbers at the track. <laughs> and she said, you think we can do this and I can get elected mayor? And she said, yeah you're going to be mayor. So the first point is the family support has to be there in terms of make decision making. Then the second <coughs> moment was sitting in my our family room. And I can see that as clear as day. Mandy Grumwall, who became the media darling for the Clintons sitting here, Mike Dolan, the pollster guy sitting here. <clears throat> woman and I on the couch, Mike Dino and I, he's sitting on a family chair. He lied about how much experience he had. I lied about how much money I could raise. <laughs> but we, were, we bonded and both the same height. So <laughs> well. And then Bob Ozinger from the building trades, you know, he's sitting on the step. And they said, we just did a poll. And you're, if the election's held today, you're at four, no, 7%. And your opponent's at 67, and we'd advise you not to run. And so a woman said, I don't believe the poll. And I said, well, I believe the poll is a snapshot of today. And then uh, I said, well, why don't everybody take a leave and, and then we'll make a decision. And so uh, everyone left. Ozinga gives me a bear hug. 
big union bear hug and I thought I was like a mafia giving me a bear hug that's about to end up with my body in the alley somewhere. And then Mandy says, well, you know, if you decide, let us know. And Dino says, well, let me know. And Wilma said something that caught me. She said, well, one thing's for sure. If you don't run, you can't win. And I thought about it for a minute and said, yeah, I agree with that. We had enough family members to put a platoon of soldiers in the, in the field to start with. Then my brother Joe came by the next morning when he was on Denver Police Force. Natural cop, wrong parking, wrong side of the street, gun belt, still putting his gun belt on, saying, you got to run. We had enough family members. Yeah, I said, yeah, Wilma and I decided to run last night. <clears throat> so Laura, for me, the two pivotal moments was one sitting up on the top of the Red Rocks, having a dream or an aspiration and not letting everybody say that I couldn't do it, not win and not letting anyone limit my aspirations. And number two, having the fortitude with all the experts said don't run, that we ran anyway and won. When I look back at uh, events in Denver's history and the Old Gray Mares is a great place to start, I was always struck by the bold leadership and vision of Mayor Spear. Mm -hmm. A controversial figure to be sure. But when Mayor Spear was in office, he was part of what was called the City Beautiful Movement. It was a movement that basically took over the country. And Mayor Spear went to Europe and he saw the beautiful gardens in Paris and Italy and came back and said, we're going to have boulevards. We're going to have beautiful parks. We're going to have a city park, uh, excuse me, mountain parks. And he had this vision of beautiful structures all over the city. And today we benefit and enjoy those beautiful structures because of his vision so many years ago. And that impacted me in thinking about, imagine a great city. It's gotta be a beautiful city, a place that's unique, that's very special, that people love. And that inspired me. Uh, Wellington was talking about inspirations and sometimes obstacles that are put in your way. I'll, I'll never forget the time that I ran for mayor. <laughs> and, I would go to meetings and say, hello, my name is Federico Pena, I'm running for mayor. And people would say, Federico who? <laughs> uh, I had no name recognition essentially when I first ran. And I'll never forget the day before my very first primary election, in my first election, a reporter who I will not mention came in to actually call me and said, I, my editors asked me to ask all the candidates how they're going to do tomorrow. And I said, well, I think we might even come in first place. And there was this silence on the phone, <laughs> literally. And he said, well, our polling has you coming in fifth. <laughs> and we came in first. He came into my office the next day at Jake's Auto Parts, uh, School Boulevard, some of you remember that. And he had his little pad, you know how reporters have pads, and he put it in his back pocket. And he sat down and he said, please tell me what has happened to my city. And I had to explain to him that there's been this undercurrent of discontent that I've talked about earlier and all the political pros and the newspapers missed it. They were up here and the people were here upset, wanting change, and he completely missed it. All of us in our own way have had that experience where you have confidence in your own vision, your own tenacity, and you don't listen to people who tell you you can't do anything. So Mayor Spear, to all these mayors, here we have Denver of today. Yeah, I, I think the note of inspiration is so important uh, coming out of COVID and, and moving forward. And, and I think the inspiration we have coming into this coming year is uh, we, Denver has been just recently selected as the host city for the inaugural City Summit of the Americas in 2023, uh, which is a testament to everyone's legacy here 
uh, about your work to bring Denver to, in a competitive way to the global stage. I'd like each of you to ask, uh, or to ask each of you about a transformative action that started in your terms and that continues to shape uh, Denver today. So I've got a specific question for each of you. Uh, and I'll, um, Mayor Pena, I will start with you. Go, I wanna go back to 1983. You, um, when you reflect on Imagine a Great City, how did you know we needed a bold new vision, a new way of thinking about ourselves and our city? And I think you're hinting at it, uh, obviously in some of your responses already, but if you could expand. Well, I've already talked about this sense of discontent that was an undercurrent in the city. I've talked about the fact that there were all these young people who were so talented, so energetic, and they had great ideas. And most importantly, they wanted to be a part of their government. And they all had great ideas on how to clean up the air and how to revitalize our neighborhoods and how to deal with crime, how to build an airport, whatever it was. And so that's basically what I experienced and what I saw, and I was a reflection of their attitudes and their vision and their idealism. And so that's when we came up with the theme, Imagine a Great City. Uh, it was actually a, a person who was no longer with us, a very dear friend, Sandy Widener, who uh, came up with the idea when we were in Tom Nussbaum's home, uh, having too many glasses of wine. And uh, we kept thinking, imagine this, imagine that. And she said, imagine a great city. Um, and so it reflected though, the built up, pent up imagination and interest and energy that so many people had who believed that Denver could be much more, mm -hmm. that had the potential of being much more and they wanted to make it happen. So that's how we got the city moving back then. And here we are with the beautiful city today. Thank you. I, I had a couple of biases. Um, one is that Women normally undervalue themselves when they fill out job applications or what their experience is. And men normally overvalue their experience when they're filling out a job application. So we started kind of norming it to our sense. I also felt that I wanted the cabinet to represent the best and the brightest that come from everywhere. So we could get a Shepherd Neville or get what was then and still, I believe, the best planner that ever lived, Jennifer Moulton. You get the Harvard types, uh, you get the Yale types. And I said, I also want the community college types. I want the Adam State types. I want the Western State types. I want our diversity of the cabinet when they're sitting around bringing that either rural or small college or small town experience along with those from, for lack of a better term, blue blood, blue blood institutions. Because I think Denver is made up of a variety of different people. And in order to get that, and the one driving part has to be that they have to think highly of public service. That is a worthy, it's a worthy occupation. It's worthy to give back. It's very important that you treat the people that come to the city looking for help, give them their respect and dignity because you never know when you might be on the other side of the table. I used to fight with people at King Supers. When I'd hear them say something negative about some public employee, I would accidentally hit their grocery cart. <laughs> Remember now, this is an accident. I accidentally hit their grocery cart to ask them, who were they talking? What, what employees, federal sector, public sector, private sector, they work in the worst conditions, they make the least amount of money, and they're expected to do more than anyone else. Or if you're a taxpayer, taxes that you don't want to increase. So don't tell me much about what city employees aren't doing. I think they're undervalued it as well. But um, I mean, that's kind of our sense and they have to buy into our values. I'm a parks and open space and guy will fight you over a blade of grass. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Kevin Flynn, when he was on the other side working at the Rocky Mountain News, he had an article saying, Webb talks about budget accountability, parks and open space, he skipped the welfare stuff. And I said, well, I suppose do welfare because I'm black, I guess, but I didn't do that. Right, I'm gonna, I've got a different question. But I, can, I can just do two seconds on the historic uh, moment. 
just because um, Adam Lerner, who used to run the Museum of Contemporary Art, and, and Aaron Trapp came up with this idea that we should have a biennial of the Americas and tied Colorado, Denver, but Colorado, but to Latin America and all to the South. And now Mary Hancock has got us, we're gonna have the first uh, 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 by any of the cities, some of the cities, some of the cities. cities. But anyway, that's one of those things that started, took a long time. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mike Fries had to come and be the chair of the board for, still the chair of the board yes. all these years. Anyway, that has legs. Oh. Yes, I'm lucky enough to be on the board now. So oh, yes, right. yeah. yeah, very excited about that. Uh, I am gonna go back, Mayor Webb, I have a different question for you. Uh, um, because you mentioned Jennifer Moulton, who was my mentor, and I think for many reasons uh, I am here today in this position because of her, uh, I'm thankful for that. But, but so many of your hallmarks of your administration stand out to me that are uh, the build-outs of Lowry Central Park, which I had the opportunity to work uh, so long on, uh, Central Park, Platte Valley neighborhoods. What do you think that is the greatest value of these redevelopments that have come to the city? I think the greatest value are the people that worked on it. Um, you can't take away that. Uh, I remember Andrew Wallach's job was to get money out of every department to put in the parks and open space. And my job was to protect him from everybody else killing him for taking money out of their budgets. Uh, we hired a young lawyer named Ken Salazar that was doing all of our work for the uh, purpose of getting uh, done. If we were going to hide from the press, we would go where we knew they wouldn't show up. We went to Lechugas or Pierre's. Only a certain age bracket would know where those places are located. And uh, we knew they wouldn't be showing up in those locations in North Denver, Northeast Denver. Um, but, but for me, it was it's really about the people that went into public service. You know, it's a Rosemary Rodriguez, a, a Carol Boygan, um, uh, Elder Wedgworth and, and Judy Montero, the Rev City Council, of Mejia and Rosemary Rev, the school board, uh, uh, Wayne Cawthon went to Kansas City to run city manager, BJ Brooks went to Seattle to be deputy director of parks, Adam Brickner went to Baltimore to run that drug program. I mean, to me, that was recalibrating um, public service. Uh, Stephanie Whitt went on to do executive director for Girl Scouts. Um, to me, that was that was sowing the seeds for others that come after, and you know, and I, I always had a kick out of John because John and I signed up to do something when we were fighting to make sure that the Bronco Stadium was going to maintain Mile High Stadium. So he's going to sue, but no one knows him except for being a beer owner. And I said, I'm going to sue. I'm, I'm going to support John. So then John comes to the, comes to the mayor's office. Got a ton of press. Matter of fact, I think that started your campaign, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had we had a ball doing that, uh, fighting, fighting, fighting for that. Um, but for me, it's it's always been about the people. It's been about the people. You know, the woman I grew up with two poor kids on the east side, and did not follow the guidance of our guidance teacher. <laughs> We overachieved. <laughs> We're going to circle back, Senator Hickenlooper, to you on uh, your administration spurring the investment into fast tracks, uh, and which uh, has required you know required voter support and regional partnership. The pandemic has been extremely tough on transit systems, uh, and Colorado was no exception. Certainly, the Denver region. How do we keep that momentum? How do we bring that back um, for that the importance of public transportation? How do we get that going again? Um, so let me just, before I say anything, just say that when Mayor Webb, I had a press conference about the uh, Mile High Stadium name and 20, 20 people came, a couple of TV stations, that was about it. He calls a press conference five months later. It's a longer, funnier story. But anyway, he comes up with a statement and he goes, some things just aren't for sale. And he's on the front page of every newspaper in America. <laughs> so you want to talk about leadership sometimes is taking a feeling and an emotion and putting it into a phrase, whether it's that or a great city. Uh, you know, the, the key to 
to fast tracks, and we'll come back with fast tracks. Fast tracks is infrastructure. Talk to young people why they one of the reasons they really love coming here. I mean, part of it's a thousand miles of bike trails, part of it's red rocks, part of it's having a transit system, as Michael was saying, that it, it really is a signature item that elevates us from being a you know Cincinnati or Pittsburgh to being a major city. Uh, and it will come back, but part of the way this, what mattered about Fast Tracks was bringing everybody together. Right? When we did early childhood education, we spent, we had three different commissions. We had over a hundred people that studied it. And then, and Pete Kors ended up supporting the tax increase, not exactly someone who loves tax increases. And, and yet we had that whole unity there. And what Michael's describing, what he's creating out at the airport, that's this notion of an aerotropolis that we are gonna be a global city and that airport's gonna be the key part. He's, that's where the city is now, you can already feel it, putting their energy into that. And that's that next thing. It's, it's, it's not just the thing itself as the achievement, the achievement is the process of bringing people together and committing the will of our community to get something done. Yeah, great point, thank you. Boss. Uh, just let me say one thank you today <laughs> yeah right okay got it uh, I'll, go, I'll go gentle uh, one, uh, one I just personally want to say thank you for the opportunity you've given me in this last uh, in your last term to serve uh, with you in your administration and it's it's an unbelievable opportunity to serve in the public as, as uh, Webb has mentioned she's wonderful isn't she no, thank you uh, in your state of the city speech just this past July last month, you focused on justice in all its forms, uh, including housing and climate action. Under your leadership, Denver now has branches in the, of city government exclusively focused on housing sustainability and climate resiliency. What do you hope to see come from these investments into the future? Well, what I hope, one, obviously, we're never going to build our way out of this. And by the way, I want to come back to the history question, because I think that's a key question that you asked. Um, we'll never build our way out of this challenge, this housing crisis that we have. Not only in Denver, by the way, this is a national phenomenon. Um, people have been priced out, and we haven't built housing on the scale that we need to keep pace of on uh, in this nation. And that's reality. And so Denver has a plan. It was probably 2015, 2016 that your predecessor, Brad Buchanan and I got together and he said, we're growing in rates obviously that we can't sustain, but we better prepare the city on a long range plan. The old plan no longer work, works, Blueprint Denver. We, we've got to build a plan that is built on the new Denver, people moving to our city, the desirable city, the one that we've all been working on for all these decades. And so we went back to the public and we did over two years worth of meetings to see Mary Beth Sussman, former city council one. All of us were involved in it. We had over, I don't know, something like 40,000 residents participate in one way or another in this conversation about what Denver's future looks like. And what residents said clearly was when we want equity. And I was so proud of Denver to talk about equity. And it wasn't just in communities of color. These were Hilltop and, and Southeast Denver saying equity. And let's also consider building density around our transit corridors. So people can get out of their cars and start using the fast tracks that we all invested in, in this city. And so my hope is that we not only stay committed to the plan, the long range plan, but that we also take to heart the, the word equity. There was a day I was, Denver was high flying at a clip. We were named the best city in America. We were named the best city in America to start a business, best city to start a family, best city to raise a child. And as mayor, we go to the national conference, our chest is out. Y'all, taxes, come follow us, come, come be, do what Denver is doing. But this one day I'm walking down 16th Street Mall and this gentleman stopped me and said, man, I see you taking pictures with everyone. He says, but what about those of us? who are being hurt by this explosion that's happening in Denver. And in the conversation, I said, tell me, what do you mean? He says, and what it, what it came out to be was that the word equity really means that you are cognizant in your policy decisions and your design, that not everybody starts from the same place. It was almost like what we saw in Kabul when, when that plane was taken off and people were trying to hold on. Our economy took off and people were trying to hold on to that plane. 
And if you were not prepared, if you were not stabilized at that point, you were falling off that plane. You were left behind. And that's what our economy did. It took off. We had all the metrics, but we did not plan for those who were not yet prepared to fly. And so my hope is that we take the heart with the residents of Denver said in terms of be mindful of equity. You as a city know about gentrification, uh, what plans are happening in communities that impact communities in terms of involuntary displacement, gentrification way before anybody else because they're filing permits, they're filing plans. So what do we put in place as safety nets to catch people, to protect people so they can remain in place as their neighborhoods transition? That's really what our responsibility is. And so I, I just, I hope that those, that equity, I use that as the, I was intentional to talk about justice and equity in my last state of city as, a, as mayor, because that's what I try to govern by. And I hope it's a value that the people of Denver keep in mind as well, equity and that everyone in the city is worthy and everyone in the city does matter. That's critical. Hey, if I can get to this point, I want to tell a story. Can I tell a story? And this, I think it hits all of us. And I, this was something I didn't know. When I came in and a report had just been issued that, and it was recommendation to United Airlines that they should leave Denver, Mayor Webb. I remember. And, the CEO at the time, Kim Day, and executives of the airport came to me and said, Mayor, I think we may lose United. At that time, Frontier hadn't taken off and Southwest hadn't showed up. We would have been left with a small Frontier really leading Denver. We would have been like Pittsburgh when American Airlines left Pittsburgh. In other words, you simply don't matter. It's hard to get into you. And at this point, I dispatched two, you know, two DIA executives and said, I want you to go to Chicago meet with United and you don't come home until a deal is done to extend them in Denver. There's a lot I didn't know at the time, but those young men came back a week later. I think the deal was done in 24 hours, but they came home a week later. <laughs> but really they negotiated a deal and we found some opportunities to help United save over hundred million dollars and they extended their lease through 2030. This is 2017 at the time. Last year, or maybe two years ago, I have a meeting with the president of United Airlines in Chicago. And he was a young executive at United. He said, you have no idea what you did when you dispatched those two executives to Chicago. We were preparing to announce we were leaving Denver. You didn't know that. I said, I know you had a recommendation. Yes, all the members said, United ought to leave Denver. You would have had a new airport and the biggest hub you would have had would have been Frontier Airlines. You would have died. He said, but when you dispatched those two executives and we had a chance to sit and show them what our numbers look like and they were able to do things to change our trajectory, it made a difference and it showed us that you, Denver, understood our business. Folks, today, and I'm not saying this is about me, I want to say that sometimes your instincts as a leader tell you to do something and it's not written in the job description, you just do it because it's like my gut tells me we got to do something different here. Today, United's largest hub is Denver, Colorado and growing. They will invest more in Denver than any other city in the country. And guess who else has their largest hub in Denver? Southwest Airlines. No other city in the country has two dominant hubs as their number one hub in, the, in one city. No other city. And so when you wonder what happens in history, this is a story that's never been told before. Hell, I didn't even know the full breadth of the story for, until two years ago. And so I just got to tell you that sometimes we just do things we don't know the full story. And I'm looking at a guy in the audience by the name of Tom Clark, former leader of Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation, who said something to me one day while walking into a meeting with Japanese airline executives. He leaned over to me and whispered very simply, tell them you'll share the risk. That's all. And we were sitting there and the thing about the Japanese business folks, is that they suddenly, they never say no, but they suddenly say yes. And they'll sit there 
And as we were trying to sell them for the 15th time, and I said the words, we'll share the risk. They said, <laughs> and when a year we had the nonstop flight to Tokyo, not from that airline, but United saw them about to make the deal and they moved in <laughs> and said, we'll do it. But it was, it's sometimes things just happen and it, it's beautiful, but it has been the people who made it happen like Tom Clark from the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation. We're in our last question, so it's going to be a fire, a fire round uh, here. I want to end on a fond note. Uh, this is the city we all love. What is a special memory that you have tied to a specific place, because I'm a placemaker and an urban designer in Denver? What is a special memory that you have tied to a special place? Anybody can start. We, have to get, we don't have to be chronological. Um. I'll go first because I'm not, these guys are closers. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a would be, I mean, being in public office allows you to meet people you could never meet any other way and, and have opportunities that most people don't ever get. And I love music. I unfortunately have no talent. I can't carry a tune, but through a chain of coincidences, there was a guy named Ketch Secor who'd gone to school with my wife, Robin, and his band, Old Crow Medicine Show, was playing at Red Rocks. And he decided that I should go out there and play the banjo. And then literally, after we practiced a little bit backstage, uh, he said, oh yeah, you're gonna sing the, the second verse. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well, it's gonna be really awkward. It's gonna be quiet. But that, they, and they had sold out Red Rocks. Uh, and, uh, and just the fact they introduced me, I went out with the banjo and I could play the banjo well enough. I think they might have turned the volume of my banjo down. <laughs> but then when it came to the second verse, he kind of pushed me in the microphone and I just sang as loud as I could. And the wave of applause, I would, it was more energy than I'd ever gotten at anything in my entire life. And it, you know, in Red Rocks, it was just, what can I say? I'll never forget it. That's awesome. Thank you. This episode for me would be coming out of the uh, 1991 campaign during the walk. Um, sometimes problems, obstacles become really challenges that work in your favor. Uh, we had no money. Money was drained. We we're trying to get to second place so we can get in the runoff. It was always my belief that if I was in the runoff with either one of the individuals that were ranked one and two, oh, well, athletic instinct, I could whip them. Uh, but my fear was finishing third. And I remember walking down the 16th Street Mall and a woman stopped me and gave, she said, I want you to have this dollar for your campaign. And I said, if you want a dollar here, you need this for yourself. And she said, that's all I have to give. And I teared up and I kept walking and then we walked up my view. And then there was a woman that had her kid in a stroller. And we were walking from uh, Mount View and Logan on our walk towards Mount Bella. And we were going to turn and so she walked with us as far as uh, Quebec. And I stopped her and said, why are you, you have better things to do than walk your baby down here while we're trying to get into Mount Bello. And the walk was great because I could always tell what neighborhood I was in by what they served for breakfast. I mean, if it was, if it's pork chops and grits, I knew I was in Northeast Denver. You know, if it was green, if it was green chili, I knew I was in West Denver. If it was lox and bagels, I knew I was in Southeast Denver. If I was at Smyrna House, I knew there was oatmeal, maybe, um, <laughs> but it wasn't going to be healthy. But I said, "Why are you? Why, why are you walking? Why are you doing this?" And she said. I want to be able to tell my child when he grows up that I work, walked with the first black mayor at Denver. And I said to myself, 
And I called Roman and said, this is a, this now is taking on a faith-based inspirational kind of thing. And then Mike Dino and, and, and Greg Kolometz and others who was doing all this logistical stuff. I didn't know they were making half of it up on the way. <laughs> <laughs> so then I stopped at a uh, house on Colorado Boulevard, South Colorado Boulevard, and, and my feet were bloody from the walk with the blisters underneath, you know, the blood sticks to your socks. And so the doctor says, well, I'm not supposed to do this, but um, you take your shoes off and I'll land some blisters, clean your feet and bandage you back up so you can walk, start walking the next morning. And to me, the whole walk episode was about the city of Denver giving somebody a chance that wasn't expected to win. Thank God for the Rocky Mountain News. I think they were the only newspaper that endorsed both me and Federico when we were supposed to lose. Um, and, and you, and John. So, Michael Clement, they endorsed Michael too. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so. But, but the learning experience for me is that people in Denver will give you a shot and give you a chance. And people back east ask me, but didn't color enter into it? Or what about race? And I said, no, we live in the West. And it's always been my belief, if you live in the West, two things happen. If you can get the wagon train over the mountain, they don't give a damn if you're black, brown, white, if you're a male or if you're female. If you get the wagon train over the mountain, they hire you. If you don't get the wagon train over the mountain, they fire you. It's real plain and simple. And that's and I think that's our Denver edict of what we are and that's how we live. I'm gonna let my mentor go last. Okay. Um, I, I will. I will tell you that I, I. I think the rec centers hold a special place for me in this city. It was our safe haven. Uh, it was the only place that we could go. Um, and unfortunately, over the years, between being a, a young person going to the rec centers and becoming mayor, we had locked the rec centers down from our children and uh, from most uh, of our children. When I became mayor, there were only 700 of our children who were members of the rec program. But we were seeing 30% um, truancy rates. We had a, a pretty high pregnancy, teen pregnancy rate in the city. Um, and, you know, juvenile delinquency and crime was, was rampant. And our dropout rates were astronomical. Um, and a seven-year-old young lady, and I wish I could find her now, stopped me one day and said, why is it so hard for us to use the rec centers? I think we were charging $30 a year for a child to use a rec center. And if they couldn't afford it, they had to go home and get a bill from their parents to prove that they lived in the neighborhood to get a free, get a rec car, which most of the kids wouldn't do and parents were not gonna do. Uh, they were afraid that they, they just wouldn't do it. They were embarrassed to do it. And so the young lady said, why don't you make rec centers free for all kids? And just that conversation with her reminded me of the power and the, san the, the sanctity that the rec centers gave us the haven. When nothing else worked, the rec centers were there and Red Shield Community Center. And so we, we created in partnership with this young lady, the My Denver card. And overnight, what seemed like overnight, instead of 700 kids trickling into a rec center, we had over 100,000 kids going into our rec program. And that was an impactful moment that I'll never forget. Am I last? Oh gosh! Closer. No, no, no pressure. Yeah. Uh, I think your question was: Is there a place, or yes. maybe an experience that in Denver, in Denver, that you that were, is special to you? That is special to me. There are many, but but let me talk, if I can, about two, and one might very much surprise you. Uh, it's not the big things the big buildings and the big projects, whether it's Cherry Creek or convention centers or a new public library and all of that. It frankly is a very small thing that was so important 
to the neighborhood, to the people in the community. And I talk about this very often when people say, what's the thing you're most proud of? In addition to opening up city government to people, there is a place that I have fond memories of, and that's the Mayan theater. That may surprise you, but there's a story behind that. And the story behind that was that there was a Canadian company that bought the whole block and they were gonna demolish the Mayan theater. The neighborhood galvanized around this and they were the friends of the Mayan. They wanted to protect it and save this historic building. One of the few left Aztec-like architectural theaters in the country. I think there were only two that were left. And the city council passed a resolution making it difficult by extending by 90 days the demolition, but it didn't stop the demolition. And so on the last day, they had the bulldozer there with the wrecking ball literally ready to hit the wall down. And uh, Bill Lamont, my <clears throat> planning director, we all had planning directors that were terrific, came to me and said, would you be willing to call the Canadians and ask them if they will give the neighborhood the citizens of the friends of mine and the city and the planning office an opportunity to come up with an alternative. And so I said, of course. So guess who I called? Pat Bolin. <laughs> God bless Pat Bolin. Because he had all these Canadian friends and I called Pat and I said, Pat, they're gonna knock down this building, can you? He says, sure, I'll call, I think it's Mr. Landon or someone like that, the Canadian. And they stopped the wrecking ball. And as a result of that, the planning office and the neighborhoods and the developers all came together and we agreed to give them higher aviation rights so they could build higher, but to preserve and save the Mayan theater. A little thing, but so important to the community and the neighborhood. And to me, that was the power of people. That was so important to them and their neighborhood. And so I'll close with this. We can talk all night about all the big projects and we're all very proud of them and we know how important they are. And the airport, of course, is now the third busiest airport in the world. Um, it's incredible to think about that. But at the end of the day, when you think about the future and this event in 2023, we'll be talking about the future. The future of cities are really about the people in those cities. And that's not just a statement to make. I'm very worried about where our city will be in 10 or 15 or 20 years. Will we be a city only for the wealthy? Who can afford $2 million homes? We've seen that happen around the world, I mean, around the country, where only the very wealthy can live in certain cities, which I will not name. And everybody else has to move out to the suburbs or somewhere else. So I ask all of you, what can we do to make sure that this city maintains its historic character? The thing that I loved about Denver when I first moved here was the ethnic neighborhoods all over the city. Mm -hmm. We can't lose that. That's part of the character of the city. That's what makes Denver unique. That's why people want to come here. So we've got to find a way to ensure that this city maintains its diversity, its beautiful ethnicity, its uniqueness, and that's going to be hard. But whatever we do in the future, and I know there are probably mayoral candidates here who are thinking of running for mayor, God bless you, and thank you, thank you. We need people who wanna do it. Think about the city, and as you think about building the city, think about the people. Are we gonna lose that special character of Denver? whether it was Mayor Spear, the city beautiful movement, or a city that the mayor that built an airport out in the sticks many, many years ago, really, it was called the folly, or all the other things that we're very proud of, which make Denver unique. At the end of the day, we wanna say, this is still a place where people from every walk of life can live and want to live, and that's what makes Denver truly beautiful. That to me is a sign of a great city. Thank you all very
Okay, what, what a blessing to be here on this beautiful night in this beloved city with these transformational and inspirational leaders. Thank you so much, gentlemen. And thanks to all of you for being here with us and for sticking with us through our dramatic uh, interruption. Um, big love to all of you and to our team here so, who so elegantly take care of us during this moment. Thanks so much, have a great evening. Yeah, thank you, just some excitement. Uh, we have a lost phone. If you wanna come up to the front desk, if you can't find your phone, uh, it will be there. Thank you.